Hi, everyone. I'm Maurice Samuels, the director of the Yale Program for the Study of Antisemitism, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first event of the 2023-24 academic year. I was on leave last year, which was great, but I'm also very happy to be back hosting these events. Uh, this year, some events are going to be on Zoom and some are going to be in person, but we're going to be broadcasting the live events on Zoom as well. So I urge everyone to check out the YPSA calendar of events on our website and get on the mailing list. I'm especially excited to introduce today's speaker, Martha Hodes, uh, since she was the interim director of the Doris and Louis B. Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, where I had my fellowship last year. Um, so I had uh, the chance to have many conversations with Martha as she finished this book. Um, she's now back to her regular day job as professor of history at NYU, where she, she specializes in American history of the Civil War. She's the author of many books, including White Women, Black Men, Illicit Sex in the 19th Century South, The Sea Captain's Wife, A True Story of Love, Race, and War in the 19th Century, and Mourning Lincoln, which won the Lincoln Prize in 2016. Actually, all of her books uh, have won awards and made many best book of the year lists when they were published. Martha is a past recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship and has many other distinctions that I won't attempt to list because I'm so eager to hear her talk about her fascinating new book, My Hijacking, A Personal History of Forgetting and Remembering, published by HarperCollins this past spring. Before I hand it over to Martha, let me just explain how things will work today. Uh, Martha is going to speak for about 35 or so minutes, I think. Uh, then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Please submit your questions to me using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And I'll do my best to ask as many of them as I can. Uh, we can't see or hear you, however, and the chat function is disabled. So please only use the Q&A function. And you can send questions as soon as you think of them. You don't have to wait for the talk to be over. You can just start sending them to me. Um, okay, so that's it for the housekeeping, and I will now hand it over to Martha. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maury, and thank you for this opportunity to present to this group, and I thank everybody for tuning in, everyone who's with us today. Well, as maybe was clear from Maury's introduction, I've never written a book like this one, My Hijacking, A Personal History of Forgetting and Remembering. I'm a historian of the 19th century United States, and all my other books focus on race and the Civil War era, the most recent, uh, a book about personal responses to Lincoln's assassination. My hijacking, like my other books, is based on deep archival research, but here I also intertwine my own memories and my own research into family history. This book, for those of you who haven't read it, is about the hijacking of three planes in September 1970. The hijackers were members of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a radical Marxist-Leninist faction, too radical even for the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO. I was 12 years old at the time, a passenger on one of the planes. I was traveling with my 13-year-old sister, Catherine, and we were unaccompanied by adults. We were returning to New York from Tel Aviv. My mother had moved to Israel to help start the Bet Sheva Dance Company under the direction of Martha Graham. My parents were both former principal Graham dancers. And my sister and I spent our childhood summers in Israel. And I'm just going to share a couple of images with you. That's me on the left in the summer of 1970 at my mother's Tel Aviv apartment building. And then my sister, Catherine, and me practicing our yoga poses on the beach. And that photo on the right was taken the day before we boarded the plane home. Catherine and I were held hostage in the Jordan Desert inside the airplane for a week. Our captors hoped to exchange the passengers and crew for Palestinian prisoners. The book then is something of a hybrid about my own participation, if unwitting, in a world historical event. 
What I'd like to do this afternoon is, is offer to you various parts of the manuscript with interjections for my listeners here today. So to begin, I will set the scene at the outset. Sunday before sunrise, everything is dark and quiet in our Tel Aviv neighborhood. We packed the night before, and now my mother helps us close the tops of our identical gray suitcases. At Lod Airport, not much more than a single building, we come to an ascending stairway with a big Bon Voyage sign hanging above. From there, travelers must proceed alone. And when we arrive at that stairway, my mother puts on her sunglasses. She is crying because she has to say goodbye to us for a long time. I like that memory. Something about it parallels my favorite book in the summer of 1970. My Israeli stepfather had given us The Little Prince with an intriguing cover illustration of a young boy standing on a barren planet with a miniature volcano. First, my stepfather read the story to us, then I read it to myself, enchanted by the lonely aviator narrator whose plane crashed in the desert and the downcast boy wanderer he met there. That boy, The Little Prince, bids farewell to a temperamental flower, a rose he loves very much. Of course I love you, the rose tells the little prince. It is my fault that you have not known it all the while. She implores the boy to be happy and asks him not to linger, for she did not want him to see her crying. I read the book twice more until I had it nearly memorized. In my diary, I wrote, it is fantastic. In various parts of the book, then, I interweave quotations from The Little Prince, which appear in the text in parentheses, and you will hear some of these in the next while as I'm speaking with you. To continue from a bit farther on, takeoff from Frankfurt is right on schedule at 11.02 a.m. Less than an hour later, as we soar over Belgium, the captain announces an altitude of 28,000 feet with Brussels visible on the left. I hear a commotion, shouting that sounds angry, words I don't understand. Now a woman is running up the aisle. A man follows, both of them shouting. Some passengers think a husband and wife are having a violent argument. Others that the woman is airsick running to the bathroom to vomit. I see only a blur, but Catherine sees the man's gun. Others see the nickel-plated revolver too, along with the woman's finger inserted through the ring of a hand grenade. I hope it's not the Arabs, gasps the old lady sitting in our row. Clutching her heart, she moans, my pills, my pills, prompting Catherine to rummage through her handbag. The old lady warns my sister, who's crying as she searches for the medicine, to take off the Jewish star hanging on a slim gold chain around her neck. The purser still thinks a man and woman are fighting with each other, and he runs after them, clapping a hand on the man's shoulder. The man turns, points his gun, and shouts, get back, get back. Oh my God, the purser cries out, I don't believe it. Just in front of the curtain that leads to the first class cabin, the man and woman turn to face the passengers shouting, hijack, hijack. People speak urgently, if quietly, some exchanging phone numbers and pledging to notify family members should only some of us survive. Soon a woman's voice comes over the loudspeaker, which I record this way in my diary. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am the new pilot who has taken command of your TWA flight. Keep calm. Please cooperate and put your hands behind your head. Catherine and I copy the other passengers raising arms and lacing fingers. I wonder why the woman doesn't tell us to put our hands over our heads the way robbers do. But she isn't trying to prevent the passengers from drawing weapons. Instead, she needs all of us to brace for impact in case something goes wrong in the cockpit. The landing is a greaser very smooth with no damage to the aircraft. Local time is 6.40 p.m., about a quarter hour before sunset. I let Catherine appraise the situation. Leaning past me, she peers out the window at billows of dust and sand, which look like smoke. Commandos on the ground have fashioned a makeshift runway by lining up barrels filled with sand and diesel-soaked rags, and the blazing torches light up people in military uniforms, which make it look like a war. Someone props a ladder from the back of a truck up to the plane's front exit. People dressed in fatigues ascend the ladder, armed with flashlights and rifles, lanterns, and machine guns. 
Some are boys no more than 14 or 15 years old, and some are young women with short hair. The men and women who took over our flight climbed down, triumphant heroes welcomed by their comrades, melting into the outdoor throng, never to be identified. Listening to my captors, I absorb both apology and explanation. In one imprinted memory, I watch commandos carry thick yellow cables, the faces of the men expressionless as they go about their task. Although I determine somehow that this is dynamite, there's no memory of accompanying emotion, only the sense of a child intently watching every move. Again, I'm going to share a couple of images with you. You can see here two of the three hijacked planes in the Jordan Desert, our TWA airliner on the left and the Swiss airplane on the right. In between flies the Palestinian flag. A few days later, a British plane, BOAC, would join us. Here you can see the three planes in the desert. When I began writing this book, many of my memories of the hijacking were pleasant ones. One day when Catherine's diary was resting on her tray table, one of the commandos spied the heart she'd drawn on the back cover with the name of the Israeli boy she liked that summer. Eyes twinkling, the man exclaimed, romantic. Once when our captors let us outside, one of the commandos joined the children in a game of jump rope, belt clanging and military boots thumping. Another day sitting in the shade under an airplane wing, someone started a round of John Denver's leaving on a jet plane which the folk trio Peter, Paul, and Mary had made into a hit single that year. Loud voices among the singing hostages changed the words to living on a jet plane, which Catherine and I thought was hilarious, and everyone was laughing as we sang the line, don't know when I'll be back again. In the book, I write about the time in my adult life when I began to think about the hijacking again. It began right after 9-11, and here I hasten to add that there's no straight line from the 1970 hijackings to 9-11. After all, the Popular Front was a Marxist-Leninist organization. They were not Muslim jihadists. Nonetheless, a day of multiple hijackings understandably unburied memories and feelings. Soon after 9-11, I was on my way to the University of Michigan to give a lecture. I alerted my host, <clears throat> that I reserved the right to turn around on the jetway if I couldn't bring myself to board the plane, a warning she accepted without question. There was no need to reveal anything more since in October 2001, people all over the world were afraid to fly. Some on the flight cried, cried quietly, others prayed visibly. For the first time in 30 years, other people were acting the way I always felt on airplanes. And that's when memories of the hijacking began to intrude. Right away, I wrote down everything I could conjure. It was all murky and there wasn't much. And for the first time ever, I wanted to know more. Telling the stories of our own lives, how can we answer the questions we think to ask later on after the passage of so much time? A historian by trade, I wanted to do more than excavate just my own memories. With a scholar's passion for evidence and accuracy, I wanted to compare recollections, compare documents, and compare recollections and documents with each other. As a hostage, I had quelled memories and emotions. As a historian, I wanted to search for facts and feelings to provide meaning for everything that had happened to me and my family. I dug farther into my own memories and I put my memories together with Catherine's. I began to talk with my elderly parents, taking note of my father's carefully scripted stories, my stepmother's more nuanced versions, and my mother's misty memories. I found mementos my father had saved, some in my old room, some in his self-storage unit over on 11th Avenue. I talked with childhood friends, rekindling snuffed out conversations about a topic I hadn't mentioned in decades. I asked friends from high school, college, and beyond if I'd ever even told them I'd been hijacked. I visited archives, read news coverage, and watched television broadcasts. I read the manifestos of my captors and listened to their narratives, past and present. I met and conversed with fellow hostages. I went back to the places where everything happened. I wondered, 
If I researched the hijacking as a historian, could that stamp out the absurd sensation that none of it had ever happened to me at all? Could recovering the feelings that accompanied the hijacking make real something that felt so unreal? Inside the plane, I had my diary with me and I wrote every day, setting down a little over a thousand words during my desert sojourn. Historians prize personal writings that date from the time and place under investigation. And when I started out, I was confident that my diary would be my trusted scaffolding and in the moment account of everything that came to pass along with my thoughts and feelings, up in the air, in the desert, at release and upon return. In 1970, I named my journal Claire, writing my entries in the form of letters. In that technique, I copied Anne Frank, who began her diary entries with Dear Kitty. Anne Frank and I both wanted to be writers, and her birthday was the same as mine. With a combination of ingenuousness and self-consciousness, I could be an observant 12-year-old. But rereading my diary so many years later, it became clear that during that week in September, I had constrained my powers of observation. So much happened that I never recorded. It was as if I'd named my diary Claire, meaning clear, as a way to fool myself that I wrote my entries with any transparency. I never wrote about the gun I saw in the co-pilot's neck up in the air. I never wrote about the commandos I watched wiring our plane with dynamite the night we landed. I never wrote about the time one of the women commandos pointed her gun straight at me. When my history students work with first person historical documents, whether diaries, letters, or courtroom testimony, I prompt them to ask, why did this person tell this story this way? Rereading my diary while writing the book, I saw that the aspiring writer in me had constructed not a full record, but instead a tolerable story, not an honest story, but instead a story I could tell when I got home. That narrative of omissions would comprise my version of the hijacking and I would carry it with me for years and years afterward. Unsurprisingly then, in the course of my research, I became aware of aspects of the hijacking far less pleasant than much of what I remembered. For one thing, there was a stream of weapon laden visitors who filed up and down the narrow aircraft aisle. Some pointed to the hostages and laughed. Others acted like tourists taking in the sights, prompting one among us to joke that we were the main attraction at the Jordanian branch of the Bronx Zoo. Within sight too were tanks and heavy artillery. A reporter described, quote, manned anti-aircraft and anti-tank guns in trenches dug around the three aircraft and a big detachment of guerrillas armed with submachine guns and hand grenades standing on the alert. We were surrounded in turn by Jordanian army troops signaling, signaling our position in a war between Jordan and Palestinian insurgents. Besides the guns and grenades and armaments, there was the dynamite and a shifting deadline. A representative from the International Red Cross came on board one day to assure us that in his words, the entire world knows what's going on here and that everyone was working on a solution. He then candidly added, we don't know if we will succeed. Sometimes the commandos would tell us, we cannot wait forever and you will all go to a fiery death if this thing isn't settled soon. Holocaust survivors among the hostages faced their own demons with confinement and weaponry stirring up unbidden memories, only intensified by the troublesome construction of Arabs as the new Nazis. One woman 38 years old had gone to Bergen-Belsen in a cattle car. Her father was murdered in Buchenwald and 10 aunts and uncles died in Auschwitz. Her captivity inside the hijacked plane brought me, she would say later in her broken English, all the memories again back from concentration camp, which was a very big nightmare. Writing the book, I set out to discover the contours of the demands of our captors, something I didn't entirely understand at the time. Sifting through communications preserved in the Richard Nixon Presidential Library in California, some marked top secret, in the State Department archives in Washington, in the Swiss Federal Archives and the British National Archives, I set out to make sense of the negotiations for our release or its opposite. 
A document in the Nixon Library quoted a spokesman saying the Popular Front had brought explosives on board ready to, quote, destroy the planes along with their prisoners should the demands of the Popular Front not be met by the deadline. I studied the document with care to be sure I understood everything correctly. The spokesman, quote, hedged when asked if the passengers would be permitted to get off first, but guerrilla sources said the plan was apparently to blow up the hostages also, unquote. The commando's ultimatum was repeated in another telegram. Quote, time period for meeting all of the demands is 72 hours. If demands are not met within this time, planes with all passengers will be blown up. A Swiss official, described by a colleague as level-headed and not given to emotional talk, noted the serious possibility of, quote, a bloodbath in the desert. The weapons and the dynamite and the deadline. When I returned home, I would say, I didn't really think about that. During my research, as I learned more about my fellow hostages, I also discovered something else, that my sister and I were different from most of the other American Jews on our plane. My parents were, my father's parents, my father's parents were, in the words of his brother, world-class, non-practicing Jews. On my mother's side, my grandmother had refashioned herself from Libby Yetta to Lily Yvette. As part of that transformation, she spoke with an affected British accent, prepared ham for Sunday dinner, and bought Easter hats for her granddaughters. Our reason for traveling to Israel also made my sister and me different. This was only three years after the 1967 war when American Jews flocked to Israel, happily visiting the territories wrested from Jordan the old city of Jerusalem, including the Western Wall, and the holy sites of Hebron, Jericho, and Bethlehem on the West Bank. No one ever took Catherine and me to those sites, and the only reason we were going to Israel was to visit our mother. In the words of one dance historian, though of Jewish extraction, Linda Hodes, my mother, had never been interested in Israel or Zionism. When my mother and Israeli stepfather took my sister and me to visit friends in the artist colony of Ein Had, we had no idea that the hundreds of Palestinians there in 1948 had been exiled to refugee camps, the village soon resettled by Israeli artists. In a letter home to our father, Catherine wrote, painters, printers, and sculptors live there in quaint little Arab style houses, enraptured and entirely unaware of the history she was describing. Everywhere are beautiful mountain views and flowers, she wrote. I had no idea that Palestinians had once lived in Israel because many Jews in 1970 had no idea either. The historian Omar Bartov, whose elders made their way from Eastern Europe to Palestine, lived, he wrote, next to quote unquote, abandoned Palestinian villages. But as a child, he never once, those are his words, considered the origins of those ruins. Nor did the Israeli kids we played with have anything to teach us on this count. Israeli writer Ari Shavit, around my age, noted that his grandparents and parents proceeded with their lives as if Palestinians, quote, never existed. Catherine and I were aware that our captors wanted us to empathize with them, and we were interested in the stories they told. This is how we live every day. This is all we have to eat. We have no homes. And once again, said the aviator in The Little Prince, without understanding why, I had a queer sense of sorrow. Children trying to make sense of global politics in human terms, Catherine and I stirred the new history we had learned in the desert into the history we already knew, then stirred the pain of our captors into our own fears and the fears of our fellow hostages. In Israel, our friend's parents had taken refuge from the Holocaust, witnessed the death of family and the loss of homes in Europe, escaping the destruction of the Jewish people. Our captors who bore no responsibility for the Holocaust had in turn lost their homes in Palestine, many of them raised in refugee camps. History was the key, yet each side told completely different histories. What are your feelings toward the guerrillas now, my father would ask when we got home, and I have this conversation on tape. The Palestinians, Catherine corrects him, no anger, no resentment, my voice comes on the tape. They have some type of point which I didn't know before I offer. They have something they are really trying to say and they need to say it. It's pretty sad. My sister continues. 
I was very naive about the political aspect. I learned more, a lot more than I knew before. Per their purpose was to get back their home, she explains, and the plea of any peoples to get back their home is a valid plea. My sister and I puzzled out the question, could Israelis and Palestinians live on the same land? Maybe it had once been possible, we thought, but there was so much anger now, so much hatred, that it didn't seem possible anymore. We couldn't think of a solution. I stopped in my tracks, my heart torn asunder, but still I did not understand, said the aviator in Little Prince. There in the desert, Catherine and I just felt sorry for everyone. Now, in part, the book traces my journey toward understanding that my sister and I had really been there, inside that plane, in the desert, held hostage for a week. In the National Archives in Washington, I watched raw news footage preserved by the CIA of our release. Though at the time, Catherine and I didn't know where we were going, where we were being taken, or what would happen next. It was early afternoon when we arrived in a van at the Intercontinental Hotel in Amman, Jordan. Watching the tapes, I see some of what I remember. Soldiers direct our vehicle. A commando holds a megaphone, horns honk, people speak in Arabic. 13 minutes in, the tape switches to the inside of the van. Passengers displaying expressionless caution. A photographer had thrust his camera straight into one of the open windows. And there we are. And I'll show you an image. Here's a still photograph. I sit impassively, hand to cheek, shielding me, partly obscuring me. Catherine looks straight into the lens, serious, responsible, afraid. On the tape, she twists around to look out the windows, scanning the commotion, planning what to do, thinking, how can I keep us from being separated? How can I keep Martha safe? Tentatively then on the tape, I look around too. Right there on the screen before my eyes is the 12 year old girl I've been trying to conjure. But there's that feeling again. Despite all the documents, despite all the fellow hostages I've met and talked to, many of whom after all, don't remember Catherine and me. There's the feeling that the hijacking must have happened to someone else. Studying the moving image of that girl makes me feel more than anything else like a historian coming upon a visual representation of her long research subject for the first time. Watching the tape all those years later, I write down, I can't believe I was there. I'm going to dedicate this next passage about our arrival at Kennedy Airport to my father who died at the age of 98 before he had a chance to read the book. Of course, I could have given him the manuscript at any point, but I never did. I see my father before he sees us. He's so pale that the words white as a sheet leap into my mind. Then he sees us and bolts forward and Catherine sees him too, his expression changing instantly from grave to beaming, now waving at us wildly. He breaks into a run and so do we, the scene I'd imagined so many times coming to life. My father folds his arm, arms around both of us at the same time. Oh, dad, Catherine says, we were so worried about you. My stepmother stands by, astonished that the two of us are so calm. In her words, no crying, no tears, ready to go. Nothing about him, said the aviator in The Little Prince, gave any suggestion of a child lost in the middle of the desert. Decades later, researching the book, I asked my father, did you ever think we were going to die? No, he says, right away. I always knew we were coming back. Not for a second, he tells me, did he think otherwise. My stepmother remembers it differently, though. She describes my father during those days and nights as a man on another planet, at once stoic, frozen, and devastated. Was he thinking of never getting you back, she says? Well, yes. Killed and never coming back? Oh, yes. And the last bit I'll share this afternoon takes place in the summer of 2019. So this is your first official visit to Jordan, says our guide Salah Klaifa, trim in his blue jeans and short, short sleeve green shirt. Though his degree is in economics, Salah has a special interest in travelers who care about history and politics. The makeshift desert airstrip no longer exists, now buried beneath the buildings of a recently constructed defense plant. 
At the security station that blocks the entrance, men emerge, shake hands, speak in Arabic. I can see Salah gesturing toward me, explaining why I'm there. He comes back to the car to say that the plant is a completely restricted area, that it's impossible to gain entry. The security men have given Salah directions to an unrestricted high point, and we head south, then west, our driver pulling onto a narrow paved road, then a dirt road, until we come to a stop near a trash dump with feral dogs scrounging in the detritus. It's 8.30 in the morning and it's already hot as we crunch across the powdery line that covers our shoes in white dust. You were on your way back to the place where you landed, the aviator asked the little prince. At your time in 1970, this was just desert, Salah says. Almost 50 years later, I stand on the ledge, looking north over a flat expanse of scrub. A steel factory and parts of a petroleum refinery rise to our west. The newest part of the city of Zarka spreads out behind us. The sand, I think, would be in that area, Salah says, pointing to a low ridge and the hills farther on. Then you don't remember, said the little prince. This is not the exact spot. Comparing the coordinates of the satellite image to a cell phone compass, Bruce, my husband, with me that day, determines that we're less than half a mile away. We're standing on the crest where reporters coming from Amman caught sight of the three airplanes laid out like children's toys or three dots on a domino. Envisioning Catherine and me, two young hostages, Bruce loses his composure behind his sunglasses. An occasional brush of wind relieves the solid morning heat, which suddenly seems familiar. I remember that it was hot like this, I say. The airplane doors were open and sometimes the breeze would come in. Bruce is taking pictures, panning with his camera. Take your time, guys, not to rush, Salah says. You can tag the photos with your location. Yes, they'll be GPS tagged, Bruce says, steadying his voice. This is where the sun came up, he observes, pointing to the east. After such a nightmare, Salah says, to come back and see the place where these things happened is something. This is the advantage of being a child at that time, because you hadn't any idea about what's going on. We stood on that ledge for little more than half an hour. Look at it carefully so that you will be sure to recognize it in case you travel someday to the desert, said the aviator in The Little Prince. I'm ready to leave. The thought comes to me. I don't ever need to come back here again. I say it feels like it happened to someone else. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Martha. Um, that was that was wonderful. And um, I, if I can just say, I, you know, I had heard Martha give uh, talks from the book, and I discussed it with her. And I, I really wasn't prepared for how moving I found the book uh, to be as I read it this summer. I, I, you know, I knew it was going to be fascinating historically, but um, I, I, it's just an incredibly gripping read, and it's also just very, very moving for in ways that I, I'd like to try to get at um, today. And in fact. Um, the first question. So I encourage everyone to please send in questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And we already have um, a couple questions. So I'm going to dive right in. Um, the first one, your eloquence and calmness in presenting the terrifying events is striking to me. I imagine that the experience contributed to a kind of emotional distance. My question, did the experience of writing the book bring more emotion to your recall of the events? And that is, having read the book, that that is in a way what you're after, in a sense. But could you talk about that? Yeah, it's such a wonderful question. Thank you. Um, writing the book was, was hard, was hard for me emotionally. Um, I was a fellow at the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers when I began writing this book. And I had a wonderful support of a cohort of fellows um, who were writing different kinds of, of works, nonfiction, fiction, history, poetry. And um, at the end of our fellowship year, I'll just share this story. Um, one of the fellows who was a very emotional person and who would often, um, you know, she would, she would cry in the middle of a conversation or at lunches. And so she joked at the end of the fellowship year, um, I think I'm the fellow who's cried the most during this year. And then I said to her, well, that's, that's if you don't count crying alone in our offices. So, mm -hmm. so writing was very hard. Um, publishing the book was hard. It was also hard for my sister, who was so incredibly supportive and amazing during the whole process and read the manuscript. Um, 
talking about it. It's so interesting talking about it. Um, I have to, in a way, assume that kind of calm. I don't know if I'd call it detached, but I have to be the writer talking to an audience. But I've also found that since the book came out, I've experienced other kinds of, of, of emotional troubles. And, you know, we always think of memoirs as somehow solving mm -hmm. past anxieties. And I almost found it to be the opposite. Writing the book was, was, I'm really glad I wrote the book and I'm really glad I researched the book and, and that my sister shared the experience with me. But having the book come out and having the book be out is actually quite difficult. So um, the questioner is is correct that that my demeanor is um, is is uh, you know something that um, I, I'm very conscious of of having to um, having to assume when I when I talk to groups and talk to readers and people, which I very much want to do and very much enjoy doing. So so thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. And uh, another one, it uh, you said it felt like it happened to someone else, um, and that's a striking sentence. As a historian, would you say that you've tried to help people feel like things happened to them? Also a wonderful question, thank you. And I, I say it's a wonderful question because I wanted to write a book that somebody could read without having had the same kind of traumatic experience I had, and that it could speak to people who, um, maybe especially people to whom things had happened as children that they were not encouraged to talk about at the time, things they didn't understand that happened to them as children. And now, of course, we're grownups, and we can go back and try to make sense of some of the things that happened to us. And what I found was, um, in a very gratifying way, I have received messages from readers who experience very different kinds of very sad events as, as young people, quite a few from, from people who lost a parent as a young child, and some in very traumatic circumstances, one from a reader who was a very young child in a car accident that, that killed her mother, but she was a survivor and nobody ever talked to her about it. I also received an incredibly, incredibly moving message from from somebody who had been violently assaulted in a in an incident that he named as gay bashing. He was in the hospital for four months, and wrote in this message that although you know he said they fixed me up pretty well physically, he was still trying to deal with it emotionally. And all of these messages said, you know, your book helped me think about these things I didn't want to think about before. Or some of them were from people who said, your book reminded me of the process that I went through when I at first didn't want to think about things and then turn to them. And so that was really important to me that the book could transcend its particular trauma and topic and speak to readers in that way. Yeah, that's what, I mean, I lost a parent uh, very young and then very quickly decided that, um, you know, that was something I had moved on. And that, that was the part that really resonated for me, you know, that you went back to school and um, acted like everything was okay. And I, I remembered something very similar. I'm wondering whether um, the, the kind of work on trauma was important to you as you wrote this and specifically, um, the idea of kind of delayed onset PTSD. And, you know, Freud talks about the concept of nachtraglichkeit and a kind of um, where, as I understand it, a subsequent event can trigger um, a feeling of trauma related to an earlier event that you didn't necessarily register as trauma at the time. And it made me think of your experience of 9-11 as that, that kind of second event here. I'm wondering if that any of that kind of trauma theory was important to you. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I have a big, long bibliography in the back of the book. And um, readers who, who skim through it will see that I read many, many professional journal articles from psychology and psychiatry journals about trauma. What was what was tough was that um, very few, really none of the articles were based on the kinds of experiments or circumstances that replicated our own. So articles about trauma and children are usually about um, sexual abuse 
or witnessing an accident, something like those were two common um, common phenomena that were often in these articles. There, there is one um, wonderful writer um, and psychologist who wrote quite extensively about children who were on a hijacked school bus. And although it was very different, her work was very important to me. Um, so that was incredibly important to me. And I did learn from it, but it's also important. And I, I do write about this in the book that, you know, PTSD was not named until 10 years after the hijacking. It was named in 1980. Now, of course, it happened. And, you know, I'm a Civil War historian. People talked about soldiers and um, shell shock and all of that uh, kind of, obviously, people were aware of it, but it wasn't named. And what I noticed in doing my research was that all kinds of authorities spoke about the event kind of like you were saying a moment ago, Maury, about, about your mother, as if it's over and that's fine. And so I was astounded to hear a newscaster just say the words, and now their nightmare was over when we got home. Um, I, I also found that I very much um, took on that narrative myself. So one of my favorite examples during my research was um, my best friend in Israel uh, was kind enough to share with me the letters that she and I had written to each other after we got home. And in one of them, I wrote to her, it was the first letter I wrote to her after I got home. And I, you know, wrote her a few things, didn't say anything about the hijacking. And then I said, I'll write you a longer letter when more things have happened, you know, as if nothing had happened. Um, and so I also talked to friends of mine, I was entering the seventh grade, who I, I talked to friends of mine in seventh grade and what their memories were. And one of them said very, very poignantly, she said to me, the impression that the girls in, in your class had was, these are her words, no harm done, no lasting effect. So I was very determined not to absorb what had happened to me. And that was the way for me to prove, I, I believe now, to prove its insignificance to myself. Um, and part of it was about protecting my parents. I didn't want them to know that I had suffered because I knew that they had suffered. So, you know, this is the, the challenge of writing about childhood trauma and childhood memories. Um, and all of that was part of the process of researching the book, writing the book, and then also thinking about the book since its publication. Okay, we have quite a lot of um, questions now. So um, one, so you talk about how Holocaust survivors experienced the, the hijacking. Um, do you make the distinction about being a young Jew having this experience versus elderly people repeating a trauma that was particularly Jewish? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I, I wouldn't say for sure. I mean, you can read the book in different ways. I think in my reading, the only way I make that distinction is by saying that my sister and I knew there were Holocaust survivors on the plane, and they had often been children during the Holocaust. We didn't know them well, but we knew that was true because we heard people talking about it, and that we felt very sorry for them. Now, as I said in, in my talk, we also felt sorry for our captors who had been children when their families had lost their homes. And so in a way, and I think I said the I think I said the line from the book. We felt sorry for everyone, um, and of course I did talk about, you know, that my sister and I were different from other American Jews on the plane. So in a way, I was twelve, my sister was thirteen. We were trying to make sense of all of this. I think we were empathic children in our own ways, and so um, I didn't. I don't believe I made a distinction in the way the questioner asked, and, mm -hmm. and it's a very interesting distinction. It was more a matter of trying to understand the circumstances of different people mm -hmm. in our midst, captors and captives. And again, kind of wanting to solve everybody's problems, but not being able to think of a way to do that. And I, the last thing I'll say, and I'll, I'll try to keep my responses short because there are many questions, but, um, oh, I'm sorry, never mind. I, I don't even remember what I was going to say. So yeah, I, mean, I do feel like there are those moments in the book where, you know, the, um, uh, I don't think this is my own projection of the reading where you're talking about, especially in the part the you know where um, they ask you whether you're Jewish, um, the hijackers, and that did. I think I'm not imagining this that you bring up that in relation to the to the Holocaust in in the book. Um, yeah, so I, I'd like to just say a little bit about that. It's very important. Um, there was the second night we're on the plane, Monday night. That was the one time where the commandos questioned the hostages and asked each hostage if they were Jewish. And my sister answered for us and she said yes. Um, and then what happened that night was quite frightening. It was the, the most frightening moment of the whole hijacking where, you know, people were 
um, taken outside to the desert. It was nighttime and, you know, there were armed commandos around us. And then what ultimately happened was a number of hot, fair number of hostages were released. From our plane, the only people who were released were not Jewish. Um, the fact is, the Jews whose names were called were sent back to the plane, but very important, and I discovered this during my research, um, there were still many, many non-Jews who were on the plane and who were retained the whole week. And our captors also kept about 50 hostages longer for two weeks longer. And about two thirds of those were not, of those people were not Jewish. And also the same night that the, some of the non-Jews from our plane, the TWA plane were sent on to Amman, Jews from the Swiss airplane were, were released. And that Swiss airplane had not made a stopover in Israel and people surmise that might've been why. Um, so, so what I write about in the book is one of the enduring myths of this hijacking is that our captors separated Jews from non-Jews, held all the Jews and let all the non-Jews go. And that's simply not true. But I do concede that it was a frightening moment on Monday night and a confusing moment. And that's, I think, why that myth um, endured. You know, I, I also should say that after that night, and I, you know, this isn't just my analysis, but this is from my research, there was never any distinction made between Jews and non-Jews. Um, our captors did make a distinction between Jews and Zionists, and they were very clear about that. And occasionally when they would interrogate people, they would ask them about their um, views of Zionism because that was a way. So what they were trying to do when they were asking these questions was to determine who would be a valuable hostage to hold longer because they wanted to exchange their hostages for Palestinian prisoners. So a complicated, complex situation. And I feel strongly and I do set this out in the book that all the facets of it need to be understood. Mm -hmm. And they also, as, as I remember, were very interested in certain Americans, especially on your plane, there was an African-American like Amer who was in the army, maybe, who was mm -hmm. kept the, the whole time. And um, there were two maybe people. Um, anyway, yeah. you, you Yeah. Can... So some of the other hostages, um, you're referring to an African-American soldier, a man named Lennett Kane, who was kept longer um, and also, I think you're probably referring to there were two diplomats, either of them were Who Jewish. Were... The, one of them eats like a secret <laughs> message. Yeah. Right? So there was, um, I didn't know this at the time, but um, what I learned was up in the air while the hijacking was taking place. This, these were two State Department officials. And um, one of them had his notes, some notes with him. And, you know, just as a kind of diplomat's fear, he ended up ripping them into little pieces and, <laughs> and swallowing them. And I, you know, I read that in one source and then it was corroborated because historians always want to corroborate stories um, in another source in which a woman told me that her eight year old son said to her up in the air, mom, why are those men behind us eating paper? So I knew that that had happened. So um, people were kept for different reasons. Um, the, the hijackers were also interested in um, Americans on our plane who had dual Israeli citizenship, and there were actually very few of those. And one of the reasons they were so interested was because um, one of the other hijackings that day had been an El Al plane that did take off from Israel. And there were, of course, many um, Israelis on that plane. And there was a real dearth of Israeli citizens that they could leverage to trade for Palestinian prisoners. And so they, they trained their sites on dual citizens, of which there were actually very few on our plane. And you're you write about how your sister answered for you when they asked if you were Jewish, and she decided to say it, say that you were Jewish, but she didn't totally tell the truth uh, that you were visiting your mother who lived in Israel, right? Yes, that's exactly right. So she said we were Jewish, and then one of the questions that that they also asked each hostage that evening was, "Why were you in Israel?" And what my sister said was we were visiting our grandparents. Now, my grandparents did live in Israel that summer, and that was true. But something stopped her from bringing up that our mother lived there. It felt too close and a little too frightening to her. And I think she felt, um, you know, she had no intention about lying about being Jewish, but she wasn't lying to say that we were visiting our grandparents. She just mm -hmm. wasn't telling the whole story. And that might have been smart because then they might have assumed that you were dual nationals in some they way. Might have. I mean, it's interesting, yeah. Maury, you're, you're quite right. The, the fact is, and I do write about this in the book, the 
the, the, our captors were quite kind to the children on the plane. Um, that was not the experience of all of the grownups by any means, especially the ones who were interrogated, um, which happened, by the way, at night when we were asleep. And I had no idea this had happened until I was researching later. But they, you know, they let us outside for air and exercise. They jumped rope with us. They sang songs with us. They gave the little kids piggyback rides. You know, we're in the middle of the desert. We can see the we can see water on the horizon because it was a mirage. And I had just learned about mirages in sixth grade. And one of the commandos you know, knelt down on the sand and explained the scientific workings of mirages to a group of children. So um, they, they were they were not personally frightening to us mm -hmm. as children. Yeah. So this you've answered. Some people have asked questions about whether your recollections were different from the other passengers. I think that answer. Here's an interesting question. Um, you speak sensitively about the events that influenced the hijackers political views. In what ways do you think your experience helped shape what I take to be your political views of the Israeli Palestinian conflict? Yeah, it's such an interesting question. You know, don't forget that I never thought about the hijacking for years and years and years. Um, when I was researching, I i mean, I, I knew obviously I was up on current events in terms of Israel-Palestine. I would say my sister who was only a year and a half older than I and just so smart and so savvy, I feel like she, so the thing about my sister, which is so amazing and this is in the book is she was so, um, she was so keen to be to never to deny how incredibly frightening and traumatic this experience was. She would never deny that. I was the one denying that. She also was simultaneously able to hold in her mind and in her heart this incredible empathy for our captors. And she she does that in a way that's, that's unusual and, and very human and very admirable. And I think in some ways I did that too, but I did it by suppressing much more ideas about my, my feelings, about fear, and then when I, you know, really began to research the Popular Front, I mean, look, first of all, you know, the Popular Front was a revolutionary minority within the PLO in 1970. And the rest of the members of the PLO, which made up of many factions, factions and many groups, did not support the tactic and strategy of hijacking. And they were quite infuriated with the PFLP. So we can't take the PFLP as representative um, of Palestinian views at the time. They were looked on with disfavor by fellow Palestinian insurgents. Um, nonetheless, you know, researching all of that and all of that context, um, I think it clarified for me some of my own views about situ the situation in the Middle East, which as a historian, uh, the last thing I'll say, you know, historians, we, we thrive on complexity. And, you know, the trouble with many dialogues about Israel-Palestine is that neither side wants to face the complexity. And so, I try to do that in the book. And maybe the fact that people on both sides have been disappointed with the book in certain ways, or maybe I should say the extremes of both sides, people have been disappointed that I wasn't straight out pro-Israel and, and, you know, in all of my renderings of this event and others were disappointed that I wasn't more sympathetic to the Palestinian plight. Um, I don't think it's that I'm not taking a stand, but I think it's that I'm trying to trying to present the nuance and the complexity, and that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, so someone writes, uh, both you and your sister seem to have had a dispassionately mature response to the hijacking at the time. Um, you were considering the plight of the hijackers. Um, did you later experience um, um, PTSD in the sense, and has, I think I know the answer to this, has the experience altered your views on terrorism or hijacking, you know, generally? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, PTSD wasn't named, but it doesn't mean yeah. it didn't exist. And so I read about the symptoms and I read about these conditions. Um, my sister and I would not have been diagnosed with PTSD when we came home. We would have been diagnosed with something called acute stress disorder, which is much more short lived. So we did, we had bad dreams and, you know, there, we had certain symptoms that absolutely did affect us. But um, some people, would have been many people would have been diagnosed with PTSD, but not everybody. Um, so that's that's the first thing. Um, I should also say that I had and still have, despite researching and writing this book, flying on airplanes, which I do very frequently, is is still very difficult for me, um, and you know still 
uh, engenders a lot of anxiety. So I completely willing to admit that. And tell me the second part of the question again. Um, you know, did it change your view of of terrorism and hijacking? Yeah. I mean, it seems like nine eleven is a motivating factor of your writing the book, right? Um, yeah, yes, I mean, it's so it's so interesting because um, the word terrorism is is a complicated word, and I'm just going to say a, a word about this because yeah. I am a historian. I care about the historical use of that word, and you know, experts disagree on the use of that word. Um, and historians puzzle out the history of the word. And I was very interested to find that in 1970, the mainstream press, so like the New York Times, did not use the word terrorists much at all. So they just guerrillas, right? Didn't they gorillas? call Gorillas. And so the words I use in the book, I do use commandos, um, guerrillas, captors. I use all of those words. Um, just to give one example, there's a New York Times headline from September 10th, 1970, that reads, Popular Front Most Militant Commando Group. So, you know, and that was, I, I got the word commando, actually not from my captors, but from the press. And I wanted to be historically accurate. And, you know, people have written about the trajectory of the word terrorism. Um, you know, the hard part about the word terrorism is for whom do you use it and and for whom do you not use it? And so, you know, the the leader of the, the and founder of the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine, George Habash, who, by the way, was was Christian, um, was not Muslim. Um, you know, he he would say that terrorism was, and these are his words, was what made of us refugees. So it's a complicated term. Um, I mean, obviously, I didn't condone 9-11 or the Munich Olympics or what happened at Entebbe or any any of those things. Um, and, you know, even when we came home and I have this conversation on tape and somebody asked my father, you know, how do you feel about the gorillas, I think is what the questioner said. Mm -hmm. And my father said, you know, sympathetic to their cause, but not to their strategy and tactics. Mm -hmm. um, and so that also, I think, was was meaningful to me that my father could say those words at the time. Mm -hmm. OK, I, we're almost out of time. I'm going to take uh, the privilege of asking you the last question um, myself, which is um, a very interesting part in the book where you cite the hijackers saying that they were anti-Zionist, but not anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish, I think. Um, uh, and, um, you know, this, of course, is one of the main <laughs> questions facing anti-Semitism studies now. When does anti-Zionism turn into um, anti-Semitism? I'm just wondering if you could explain a little bit how the hijackers saw that difference and how you deal with it in, in the book. Yeah. So um, thank you for that, Maury. The, the Popular Front was very clear that they distinguished between Jews and Zionists. So this is what they said. I mean, you, you can take it as you wish, but it, it is their position papers. Habash, who I mentioned before, their founder and leader, um, when the hijacking happened, he had recently said to a reporter that the PFLP was quote, not hostile to the Jews as Jews and did not aim at annihilating them or throwing them into the sea. So, and, and further, quote, we harbor no hostility to the Jews, but we shall fight the Zionists because they invaded and occupied our homeland. Now, obviously that's a very loaded statement for many people. I will say though that um, from reading interviews with my fellow hostages, many, some or many of them seem to come to an understanding of that during the week. So, you know, one person told a reporter, well, you know, they like the Jews, but they don't like the Zionists. Or, you know, they said they could live with the Jews as long as they were non-Zionist. Um, and so, you know, that, that distinction isn't um, one that everybody would make. But the thing that was interesting was when our captors asked us that one night, when they asked, you know, what's your religion or are you Jewish? Um, you know, that was something that in a way was was a tactical error. And I in the book, I quote this man, William Quant, who was from the National Security Council, who said, you know, he put it this way, he said, you know, the PFLP didn't go around and ask people about their political views. They simply asked what their religion was, which was, quote, not a very smart thing to do if you're trying to combat the common view of anti-Semitism. And he's absolutely right. But what is interesting is in those I learned during my research in the interrogations of various adults on the plane, they did actually ask people their views on Zionism as a way to determine who they felt would be a valuable hostage. Um, so, you know, that I, I did a lot of reading on anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism. 
I have my own view on it. Not everybody will agree. It's quite fraught. Um, but I do think it was very important for me to read the literature of my captors um, and at least to have a sense of what their um, official positions were. And, you know, I've also talked to people who said, you know, they shouldn't, you know, people, you know, they shouldn't have asked you that question. It was just kind of a like a flawed human being thing to do. Like people don't always follow their political strategies, you know, in, in, the, in the perfect way. Um, and I, I, I do think they understood after that that night that it was the wrong thing to do. So complicated, um, again. And there was also the confusion that they would refer, they yes. didn't want to say the word Israeli sometimes to acknowledge Israel. So they would ca they would call people Jews, even though they really meant Israelis. And so that- Also, you know, very um, confusing and frightening to some people. So language, I do talk about language. In the book, and I, I actually have a, I, it's so important that I invoke a quotation from the Little Prince talking about, you know, I, I don't know the exact quotation now, but but that language can be confusing and can cause harm. And so all of those aspects um, made it in a way, and maybe this is, you decide if it's an ending point, but in a way, those co complexities and nuances made it possible for people to understand the event mm -hmm. in whatever context they brought to it before mm -hmm. it began. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so interesting. Okay, we are out of time and I'm, I apologize to everyone whose questions I didn't get to, um, but this was such, I think it's just a sign that it's such a, a rich book and I really um, urge everyone to, to read it and thank you. You can't hear everyone clapping, um, but I will clap for you. So thank you so much, uh, Martha, for, for sharing this with us um, today. Thank you so much, Maury. And I would like to thank the audience, all of you, for all of your very thought-provoking questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you to the audience. And I hope to see you at future YPSA events. So again, please check out our calendar events on our website and sign up for our mailing list. Okay, bye everybody.